motivations would lead him to accept the proposition as being true or reject it as being false. The question isn't whether it's true or false, but whether it is capable of being verified or falsified. Does it have cognitive meaning? Is it factually significant? Does it refer to anything? That's the criteria. And if you look at page um, 38, uh, you notice he talks about um, a weaker sense of verification. The question must be asked about any putative statement of fact. Is not, would any observations make its truth or falsehood certain? But, now that's what we called weak verification rather than strong verification. Okay? Is it at all amenable to any kind of support from empirical data? Um, the uh, whipping boys that he has in mind appear on page 34, where at the beginning of the middle paragraph he uh, refers to Kant who condemned transcendent metaphysics on different grounds. And at the bottom of the page, he refers to Bradley, who you remember had a metaphysic in his major work called Appearance and Reality, the very title of which is what is anathema to Ayer. Okay. Well, uh, any, any comment there? That uh, first chapter, I think, comes very clearly into focus. I might say that some positivists went even uh, one step beyond Aya uh, into asking why it is if uh, metaphysical statements are factually meaningless, that some people have persisted in making metaphysical statements. And there are two writers of particular interest in that regard. One is an American, Morris Lazarowitz, who taught at Smith College. And in a book of his called The Structure of Metaphysics, tried to, to say that this is the product of some um, um, psychopathology. That is to say, the subconscious is uh, projecting worlds which emotionally it cannot live without. And there is um, uh, one uh, individual, J. O. Wisdom, Incidentally, not the John wisdom of importance later in ordinary language stuff, but his brother. J.O. Wisdom, who um, wrote a book called... Um, no, the title slips me. The Psychoanalysis of George Berkeley's Philosophy, in which he... I was going to say argued, I think asserted would be the better, um, that um, as a result of his own posthumous analysis of Berkeley, um, he had a pathological aversion to dirt and excretion, and for that reason had to deny the independent reality of any such thing. Um, uh, this, this seems to me to be uh, a rather a pathetic kind of um, scientific attempt to explain metaphysics, because however would that be amenable uh, to um, verification or falsification? You see, it's a sort of self-refuting thing for a positivist to do. But um, uh, curious and interesting. Any comment, question? Chapter 1. Okay, Chapter 2. The function of philosophy. The function of philosophy. And uh, at the very beginning, 
you begin to see where he's heading. He starts among the superstitions. Uh, notice he cannot avoid the ad hominems. It's not very scientific. The word superstition is an emotionally loaded thing. Among the superstitions from which we are freed by the abandonment of metaphysics is the view that the business of the philosopher is to construct a deductive system. In rejecting this, we're not suggesting philosophers can dispense with deductive reasoning, but contesting the right to posit first principles and then offer them and their consequences as a complete picture of reality. So there's the farewell to Descartes, Spinoza and company. Um, instead, on 47, right across from there, um, the last paragraph begins, um, now let's see, beg pardon, on 48 is what I want, uh, 48. Yes, the little paragraph in the middle of 48, with the overthrow of speculative philosophy, we're in a position to see that the function of philosophy is wholly critical. In what exactly does its critical activity consist? Um, in the early part of the century, I think I mentioned this before, the tendency was to say that philosophy had two functions, the speculative and critical. The speculative function being the development of metaphysical systems, and the critical function being the criticism of arguments and increasingly the analysis of concepts and uh, the odd things that philosophers say. So the development of analytic philosophy in Russell, Moore and company was simply stressing and further developing the tools for critical functions of philosophy. It's the speculative function of metaphysics that is now being discarded by the logical positivists, leaving only the critical function. And um, he maintains that um, this function is one of the age-old functions. Uh, certainly Socrates' dialogues engage in a great deal of analysis criticism. Uh, similarly, too, with people like uh, Descartes, at least in Meditation One, and David Hume, and Immanuel Kant. After all, he labeled his a critical philosophy, and so forth. So he picks up several examples, and on page 49, it's the problem of induction the problem of induction, which has, of course, um, been rooted uh, historically in there being uh, some metaphysical stability, some metaphysical order, the Aristotelian kind of metaphysical order initially. But in the empiricists from Hume onwards was problematic because you couldn't know about such metaphysical order and reality. Well, um, at the very top of page 50, Ayer calls it a fictitious problem, because if the quest for metaphysical understanding is a pseudo-function of philosophy, uh, then um, the problem of not being able to gain such is a fictitious problem. It's not really a logical problem for philosophers at all. Uh, we can continue to engage in inductive reasoning for the simple reason that it seems to work for scientific purposes. What more do we want? There's a dose here of pragmatic justification for the purposes of science and common sense. We don't need the purposes of metaphysical systems with logical certainty. That's irrelevant. Um, so he, he makes that uh, knowledge of reality is simply 
not the concern of science. It's not the concern of science. And so on page 57, the paragraph in the middle of the page sums up what he takes to be the function. The propositions of philosophy, he says, are not factual. This is 57, the center paragraph. The propositions of philosophy are not factual but linguistic in character. That is, they don't describe the behavior of physical or mental objects, but they express definitions and the logical consequences of definitions. So we may say that philosophy, with its propositions, is a department of logic. The characteristic mark of a purely logical inquiry is its concern with the formal consequences of definitions, not with empirical fact. So he's going to tell us that there are no factual philosophical propositions. There are no factual philosophical propositions. Remember his delineation, two kinds of cognitive, cognitively meaningful propositions. Analytic and synthetic. The synthetic are the factual. The analytic are the formal. Okay. Um, the um, asserting and justifying formulating of factual propositions is the big business of the empirical sciences. So that philosophy's propositions have to be analytic, formal ones. We're dealing, that is to say, with definitions and the logical consequences of those definitions. <coughs> Philosophy, then, has only one function, the analytic function. The analytic function. <coughs> so then, the, the question becomes, uh, what is the nature of philosophical analysis? And that is the topic of, quest uh, of chapter 3. Chapter 3. Now, uh, here look, if you would, at um, page 60. Page 60. At the bottom of the page, the end of the complete paragraph, for the philosopher, as we've already said, is primarily concerned with the provision not of explicit definitions, dictionaries do that, but of definitions in use, definitions in use. We define a symbol in use not by saying that it is synonymous with some other symbol. Definitions give you all sorts of synonyms. But by showing how the sentences in which it significantly occurs, that is meaningfully used, okay, can be translated into equivalent sentences, the logically equivalent which contain neither the definiendum, the thing which is to be defined, nor any of the synonyms into which it would be defined. Now, a good illustration of this process is provided by Bertrand Russell's theory of definition.